And uh, the random card that happens to be on top of my red pile is probably my favorite red card, which is Dread Horde Arcanist. A card that for a long time I was convinced couldn't really reliably work in cube. And then I was like, what if what if it did? What if we just put enough one-mana spells in the cube that it worked? And now it's like my favorite build around in the whole cube by a pretty wide margin. When you get to do the thing, there is like nothing more fun than having a two-mana Kess that doesn't cost mana to cast the spells. Ugh, it's so good. I also really like this card at lower power levels if you support like combat tricks and powers matter stuff. The next card in the stack is my Lightning Bolt. I've got my fancy Judge Promo Lightning Bolt. This was uh, what I used to do for a long time to try and acquire cards that were like out of my budget or, you know, chase cards that I uh, couldn't afford otherwise. Is I used to draft before the pandemic every week um, at my local game store, whatever the set was that was in standard. And I would just save all of my draft cards because... I used so few of them in my cube, and it wasn't really building EDHX or anything at the time. And uh, then once a year, I would go to GPDC or an SCG con, and I would just like dump the whole binder and usually get like five, six, seven hundred bucks in store credit. And that's exactly where this lightning bolt came from. Uh, dumped this all in store credit and uh, turned an entire year's worth of draft cards into a lightning bolt, and I'm very happy I did so. I do not miss those cards, and I'm very glad to have the lightning bolt. Any thoughts on Ogre Battlecaster? That's one of the new ones, right? Uh, you're going to have to post the rules text in the chat. I'm not going to look it up while I'm also sleeving and streaming, but I'll weigh in on it if you remind me of the rules text. Yeah, Blunt Lord Acab. It was a nice way to, like, you know, really get those chase cards that you just can't justify otherwise. And then you're like, yeah, I just got a little bit of a... I, I'm, pre I'm pretty good at that, at, like, not getting uh, attached to all my cards and just, like, dumping my binder every once in a while. I know some people that just, like, don't ever like to let go of cards because someday they're going to want them again. And I for sure have had cards where it's like, I know I sold this on buy list for, like, $3, and now I need it again for something, and it's $12, and I feel kind of stupid. But that happens pretty infrequently for how often I've just turned a whole binder into a, uh, a beautiful card I've always wanted. Ogre Battlecaster, two and a red for a creature Ogre Shaman. First strike, when it attacks, you may cast target insert or sorcery card from your graveyard by paying RR in addition to its other costs. If that spell will be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. When you cast that spell, Ogre Battlecaster gets plus X spell to end of turn. X is that spell's mana value, and it's a 3-3. I do not like this card, personally. I'm sure it's powerful enough, but uh, costing one more mana than Dreadhorde Arcanist and making you spend the mana on the spell to flash back and all that stuff just makes it feel like a lot more like a very swingy don't let this thing, don't let this thing attack once kind of card more than the kind of incremental value that is Dreadhorde Arcanist. I mean, Dreadhorde Arcanist is really good when it gets a swing, to be clear. But um, I don't know. I like that it's mostly small spells that you're getting back and that you are doing so at a high mana efficiency. Bedlam Reveler is a card that I have been playing for a little while now that I obviously I think it's I shouldn't say obviously I think Bedlam Reveler is below the power level of a lot of the cards in my cube it's on the lower end but when it works when it does the thing when you draw it in the late game and you're hellbent you're like this card is broken and that's really fun so it's definitely at odds with all the delve spells I have but I don't mind that kind of tension of like forcing players to manage their graveyard as a resource and think about how much they're going to spend on their delve spells mana wise versus delve wise when they know they have you know a bedlam reveler or something in their deck yeah, i got all my most expensive cards that way blunt lower day cap i got my lightning bolt that way i uh i have a foil seventh edition birds of paradise i got that way which was also like 500 bucks at the time that i got it which was a lot uh, way more than i would spend on a card but it was all store credit, so I was like, it's free money. Really what it was, I mean, it's nice, because really what it was is it's money that I spent at my local game store over the course of the entire year, right? Um, which is a place I'm happy to spend money at my local game store, try and support them. Um, not just because it's owned by friends, but because I like having a community gaming space uh, in, my, in my neighborhood. And then I got to take all that money I spent at my local game store over the course of 12 months and uh, repurpose it into... A Birds of Paradise or a Lightning Bolt or whatever. 
it really helps I don't play any other kinds of magic, right? Like, I don't have to keep up with a constructed meta or, like, maintain uh, all my sets of, like, fetches and shocks for modern decks or whatever. I have not used these sleeves before. Uh, they are new to me. And I think they're also relatively new to uh, magic. And for those that are just tuning in, we are resleeving my cube in KMC Hyper Phoenixes, which I think is like their top of the line, fanciest sleeve. It's apparently supposed to be a little thicker than a regular sleeve. I'm curious to see how much thicker once I have the entire cube in my box. And um, yeah, I was recommended to do this. Someone on the Discord pointed me towards these, and uh, I'm giving them a shot. I like Dragon Shields. I really have no complaints about Dragon Shields, aside from them being a little bit too tall, so the top of the sleeve gets a little wavy over time. But that's a very minor uh, complaint. Compared to every other sleeve I've used, Dragon Shields are so much better in terms of lasting for a long time and stuff and not splitting. Yeah, I, I have not started drafting again at my local game store, uh, Violetto, just because, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for things to get back going after the pandemic. They're trying to fire drafts every Friday, but I just, I go in there every Tuesday for Cube. I'm there some weekends. I don't also go, f I'm not going to go that many times a week. I got other stuff going on in my life, you know? I say that, but it's mostly editing a podcast is the other thing I have going on in my life. I've heard some people like the Ultra Pro Katanas or the, uh, whatever the two colored KMC ones are, where they're like black on the inside and a color on the outside. That's the way to do it, Shindir. Uh, sell your cards every year and put it towards buying a house. That's what's up. That's what's up. The movie's all over a little bit. I have nothing in red over four mana in my entire cube. So let's just go ahead and move these on up a little bit. Maybe that was too far. Oh, well. It's hard. So many of these sleeves are, like, not actually perfect hearts. I don't know how this happened. I wonder if they made perfect hearts a little thicker at some point or something, because I would have sworn these were all sleeved in perfect hearts, but I found a few that feel like they're in between the width of a regular perfect sleeve and a perfect card sleeve. Uh, no, I feel I actually feel like Twin Shot Sniper is getting cast a lot in my cube. That's why I put it at four instead of uh, two. Um... More than I expected it to. You know, I mean, the reason it's in there is because of the flexibility, obviously, but it's a really good Flame Tongue Kabu. Really good Flame Tongue Kabu. Yeah, I know that uh, I basically never go down to my LGS on Commander Night, but I know that that is packed every night, like packed to the, to the rafters every week. And I don't think most weeks there is a... Uh, a full pod firing of whatever standard set is going on. Also, I'll be honest, I really kind of fell off limited a little bit when uh, when I stopped listening to limited resources, which sounds stupid, but uh, I don't play digitally, and like when I couldn't play paper limited, that was the only thing that was keeping me interested in what was going on in the like regular limited format, whatever was being played. And once I stopped listening to them, I was like, eh. So I don't know. If I had infinite time, I'd love to play more. Welcome, Alex KJ. Compared to my Magic Cube, has been bookmarked for me in Cube Cobra. That is an honor. I'm uh, I'm I'm very uh, not humbled. People say humbled all the time, but they don't mean humbled. I am touched that uh, you compare your cube to mine so often as to have it bookmarked. I love the compare feature on Cube Cobra, and I also compare mine all the time with other people's cubes. I feel like that should be even like a more highlighted feature of the site because it is so useful, I think. Re-sleeve in. Tarfire has been good for me too. Enough delirium cards in red now that uh, like red and green kind of has a thing. Yeah, Caleb Gannon's uh, Synergy Cube is uh, really is quite a work of art. I'm, I'm glad it was received so positively by the community, and I really hope that it leads to more novel cube environments being accepted broadly and enjoyed. I know that I know from uh, from talking to people that like the Magic Online Cube is by far on Magic Online the most popular cube. Like by an order of magnitude, people just don't play the other cubes. I don't get the sense that was the case for Caleb Gannon's Synergy Cube. 
and I hope people will look, take that as a sign that, hey, maybe other cubes can also be fun. Although I will say, I think part of why it was popular is because it was powered. I think if it wasn't powered, if it was just Caleb Gannon Synergy Cube, I think the cell would have been a lot, a lot uh, less compelling. Yeah, I totally get uh, playing digitally Shindir for just, uh, just like, just focusing on the game and like trying to get as good at it as possible and being competitive. It makes a lot of sense. I'm like that about so many things in my life that I'm always trying to like chill out with the competition as much as I can and just be, just be chill. Should get a fancy Ragavan at some point. I feel like we're going to get an old border Ragavan at some point, right? Right? I try to, um, Alex, I try to write pretty lengthily about all of my modifications to my cube for exactly that reason. And also because I want to keep myself honest about in the future, um, I want to keep myself honest about what my actual reasonings were. I think a lot of people have this kind of rose tinted memory about what they thought about a card when their opinion changes later on. So I try and write like pretty thoroughly what I think about cards as I'm adding them and removing them. I say that. The le most recent uh, blog post is not this. I haven't done it yet because I was rushing to get some cards added for a digital draft. But I'm going to go back and write that blog post. I swear I'm going to do it. But the other ones I haven't... Uh, where you put Bo I put Bone Crusher Giant as it is, so I think. It's been a long time since I cast Bone Crusher Giant without casting Stomp first. I don't think it almost ever happens, basically. Even if you're like the aggro deck and your opponent plays no threats, I feel like you still stomp their face before you play the Bone Crusher Giant most of the time. Obviously, I can imagine curves where you don't, but. Oh, Lelia, how I've come to love you. I really thought that card was going to be too good. And I feel like it showed me just how high of a bar there is for a three drop to be too good. It's basically like Oko and Crickets. Luris, kind of, but that's because it's a three drop you don't have to draw. Oh, I love Seal of Fire so much. The seals are really fun play patterns, I think. It's such a great cycle from uh, from Nemesis back in the day. Having to play a thing at sorcery speed. Hey, Zauno, you're sleeping up your first cube. That's, uh, that's a cause for celebration. That's very exciting. Tell us about your first cube, if you don't mind. I want to know what you built. Hi, Hillary. Uh, we're on red. I'm not going to do the whole thing tonight. I'm going to come upstairs soon. <laughs> um, we're on red. I, I might try and finish. I'm going to finish red and green tonight. I'll finish all five colors. Maybe I will uh, also stream the resleeving of the uh, lands, artifacts, and gold cards at a later date. But uh, I think this is all I have in me, in me for tonight. It's just the colored cards. This has been a lot of fun, though. Usually I resleep while listening to a podcast which is also fun, but it's nice to chat with people. It makes the time fly by a little bit. Sounds sick, Zauno. Very exciting. Rabbit Battery is a card I have effectively sold at least one person in my playgroup on, and I think it's going to spread like wildfire. Uh, this card has really impressed me. Just, it makes it so hard to... Haste is a really good ability is what it comes down to. Really, really good. Maybe they found it on the cube map, Shindir. You never know. Yeah, I mean, Rabbit Battery is just really good. Haste is a really good ability, and uh, the fact that you get this, like, pay a red and target creature gets haste until end of turn, and plus one, plus one, you have that ability just, like, for free, because you also just played a creature that, you know, could attack and block. Really, really good. The Wrath Insurance, when you uh, reconfigure it onto a creature, really good. Yeah, post that link, Zauno. Electrostatic Infantry. I feel about you the way I feel about Third Path Iconoclast, which is that I love you, but also I feel like you are just pandering to me. Yeah, I think uh, Rabbit Battery is a really good example of a card that works at a lot of power levels. It probably scales a lot with the environment. Like, this is not a perfect hard... Well, it's not a... This just feels thinner in general. Did I get, like, a... 
counterfeit seasoned pyromancer somehow? Wow. What drama on stream? Is my seasoned pyromancer fake? We're going to find out right now. Going to get out my phone's magnifying glass. This is how I do it. Yeah, rip it. <laughs> rip it on stream. Anything for the views. All right. For those that don't know, if you have a if you have an iPhone, there's a magnifier in the accessibility options, which is really quite effective. Uh, it's not in the camera; it's in the accessibility options, which is kind of cool. Did they change the name of this feature in the latest? I can't find it now. What the heck? Well, I don't know. Maybe my season primary answer is a counterfeit. It just feels too thin. It feels like it's kind of the wrong texture. I feel like I traded for it at pre-release, though. I don't think... Don't think it's fake. That would be weird. But while well, we're talking about Season Pyromancer, what a great card. So good. Fantastic. We love to see it. And then next up, we have what I think is still the most popular planeswalker on all of Cube Cobra Chandra Torture Defiance. The top cards interface is down and has been down for a long time, but I'm pretty sure it's still the most popular one. And for good reason. It's very cool. Very few four drops in red for me. In fact, do I have any other four drops in red? I have Fiery Confluence. Twin Shot Sniper doesn't really count. It kind of counts, but not really. But that's how much I love Chandra. I love how people have come to accept how good Dragon's Rage Channeler is. When it was spoiled, it really got kind of overshadowed by Ragavan, but I think is a much more elegant design. And still very powerful. It's great. This is great. Look at us. We're here talking about... People are swapping cube links with each other. It's the dream. What is up, Ubercube? Welcome to the re-sleeving stream. The re-streamening. We're on red. We've been through white, blue, black. Everyone loved it. They were cheering like crazy. Bomat Courier. What a beautiful, perfect magic card. I love it so much. How is your evening going? How is your week, Ubercube? This is not in a perfect heart. Why is my Goblin Guide not in a perfect heart? See? This is what happens. People were fainting. They were so excited about the sleeving of the earlier colors of the cube. It is true. Goblin Guide's still cool. I don't know. Still hits hard. I don't think it's like first pickable in my cube, and people definitely used to first pick it a lot and kind of force mono red aggro. But I got more mid rangey stuff now, so it still contributes to a aggressive red deck, but I think you're a little less all in these days than it used to be. Oh, you record Friday nights. Uh, this is my Bun Magic Cube, Uber Cube. Uh, I so much respect for recording Friday nights. I would not have enough energy to have my brain be uh, operating properly on a Friday night. That maybe contributes to the very fun energy on your show as compared to the kind of stuffy energy on ours. It is so cool that people are swapping cube links with each other. This is great. Ugh, very happy. Hey, Shindir, I definitely... Uh, Shoutouts to you on Fable of the Mirror Breaker. I think you told me on the Discord, I don't know, a month and a half ago, two months ago, three months ago, what is time, that uh, I should be on Fable and I would enjoy playing with it. And I was like, eh, I don't know. It seems whatever. Uh, but I have had a lot of fun playing with it. It's really fun, <laughs> turns out. 
I don't know. I don't know how I overlooked it, but you're like totally right. It is so cool to have a playable version of the like Kiki Jiki effect where you get to copy something. That's a really cool effect. And Kiki Jiki itself is either broken or, you know, not very good if you're playing it fairly. And it's so fun to have a like fairly balanced version of that effect. Alex says, can you talk about tithe as a cube card? Yeah, sure. I um I don't think it's that good. I'll tell you right off the bat. Uh, I think in my cube, which has... I'm going to put Shipment Devastator up here on the top of the curve where you want to be casting it. I think in my cube, which has a lot of fetches, you can pretty reliably trigger the second mode on Tithe, even if you're on the play in my cube. And if you can't, you know, a one mana, go get a Planes out of your deck is a really decent floor. It's like not awful ever to do that, right? So you're, you're fine if you have to do that. Um, I think it's a control card for the most part, and it's really nice that it can get planes that uh, are not basic, so you can go get your shock lands and fix your mana. So, yeah, that's why it's in there. I, I think it's um, it's not an exciting card for most people, right? They're like, oh, it's just a way to fix my mana. But the card advantage is real. If you get to... You can keep some really otherwise sketchy hands on planes tithe. Uh, that, that can become a very easy keep because you get the next two lands, the exact colors you want uh, every single time. And uh, that's a really powerful effect. It, basically, it's my it's my land tax, right? I think land tax is a very contentious card that I honestly don't know how viable I think it is. I um, I had it in my cube for a long time. Honestly, land tax is up there for the card that's been in and out of my cube the most times because I, uh, I have a beautiful judge promo that my wife got me as a gift a while ago that I, that I adore. And I want the card to be good because it's a cool old card that's like got a storied past and stuff. But um, I don't know. It so often feels like it doesn't do anything or it's just a card for when you're on the draw and it doesn't do anything when you're on the play. And uh, so it's out. And I think Tithe is like the... Tithe is to land tax as Knight's Whisper is to Necropotence, right? It's like the fairer version of the effect that is more reasonable in a deck that is just, you know, playing to the board on tempo and not trying to do some broken combo thing. So I've enjoyed it. And yeah, it's a really pretty card. I really, uh, really like the art. That kind of old school style of art is good. Weird name. Tithe. You don't really tithe with land, usually. That's up there with the fact that Swords of Plowshares and Path to Exile are not named the opposite, because they should be. Swords of Plowshares should be the one that gets you a land, obviously. And Path to Exile should be the one where you just leave, and you never come back. Approaching the end of red here. I'm curious what the future of these kind of more dedicated aggro red one-drops are in my cube. There's not that many left, honestly, that are, like, pure aggro. It's, like, Falconrath, Pit Fighter, Goblin Guide, Zergo Bell Striker are the ones that, like, don't really have play outside of a, like, full aggro deck. The other ones do other stuff, right? They they can make sense in other kinds of decks. I might put this in, like, two different piles here because I'm running out of space. So many one-drops in red. Good problem to have. Um, so... Those cards are starting to feel a little bit more narrow than the rest, right? These other cards care about types in your graveyard. They're like cool mid-range cards. Like I love Rabbit Battery and like a red-green deck where you get to play big monsters and give them haste. So I think at some point, hopefully we'll get more like textured, interesting one drops in the spirit of like a Dragon's Rage Channeler or Rabbit Battery that can uh, replace some of the more generic just punch your face in cards, which are fine. You know, nothing wrong with punching your opponent's face in, but... Yeah, I would like more cards like that. Oh, I lied. I do have one one, uh, one six drop in my red section. I forgot about this one. I added this recently because I was specifically on the lookout for more, like, splashy cards that sometimes don't get main decked, right? Build arounds or, like, kind of uh, cards that get people excited. And boy, does this fit the bill. Embercleave has been really fun. My players have really responded positively to it. It's very swingy for sure, and it is kind of on the combat trick spectrum, which I am renowned for not uh, loving all the time. But this is uh, its kind of one that like you have to work for, right? And it does pay you off when you do work for it. 
It also just like I have found that my players, whether they're correct or not, feel that this is that is a reason to be a like dedicated cheap creature aggro deck. Like Embercleave is a reason to do it. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if that's the right assessment, but it doesn't matter if they're right. That's what they're doing, and what I want to do is get them to draft that kind of deck. And Embercleave effectively does that. I'm gonna be running back to the left now. This is like a lot of work to manage the position of these cards, but I want to get a nice little shot of all of the cards laid out this way. This will also serve as a great uh, document for uh, an insurance claim if they ever have to make one. <laughs> this is way better than uh, photos of my collection, right? Videos of me handling every single card. Uh, that's pretty good in terms of proving that I actually owned it, right? Yeah. A couple cards left here in the red section. Embercleave do be killing too soon. That's what it do. I'm really glad we got new Abrade art. And I really like the new Abrade art. But it kind of came at a time where Abrade has been slipping lower and lower on my uh, on my ranking in my own cube. Just because I'm on so few artifacts these days. It's just that uh, my fixing has gotten good enough. And the like individual card quality has gotten high enough that like cards that are balanced for colorless casting costs have a hard time competing so I, I still like a braid but the number of like high value targets left in my cube are not so many i'm actually kind of hoping we get more even more stuff like in the portable hole realm to make a braid more active again where it's not like a bomb but now it's like a thing that can actually serve as a as a reactive spell at some point two cards left here in the red section Thanks, everyone, for hanging out. This has been fun. Bloodthirsty Adversary. I have not enjoyed this card anywhere near as much as I thought I would. I was like, oh, man. Because I used to think that uh, Goblin Dark Dwellers was a really cool card. And I was like, man, Goblin Dark Dwellers is so cool, but it's a five drop. I can't really afford to fit a five drop in there. And then they print Goblin Dark Dwellers. That's also castable as a two drop. And you think, that's amazing. And it also has haste. This is so exciting. But the reality is, you only ever cast it for two. I've never seen anybody cast it for five once, ever. In this cube, at least. So. And it's just a two mana, two, two haste. And all that other text doesn't matter at all. So it's going to come out soon. Honestly, I think it's going to come out for Third Path Iconoclast. I think that's going to be my cut. And boom. There you have it. Red. So many one drops, I couldn't even fit them all in one column vertically on the uh, on the camera. All these spells, all these permanents, and then uh, lots of twos. Only, you know, this tiny fraction of things above two mana. And some of them, like Twin Shot Sniper, Ember Cleave, uh, and Shivan Devastator, can in fact be cast for less mana. And it turns out, you can still kill your opponents with just, just one and two drops. Make a powerful deck. That's red.